Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Even as Artemis 1 was on its way back from the moon, another mission was launching, carrying a set of payloads which would eventually make their way to the moon. This was the iSpace lander carrying the Hakuto-R rover, and there's also NASA's lunar flashlight mission. Now, if you've played Kerbal Space Program, or if you remember Apollo, you probably have a pretty good idea of what it takes to get a spacecraft into orbit around the moon. You start out in low Earth orbit, you will make a burn that lifts the apogee of that orbit out to where the moon is, and then when it encounters the moon at the other end, you will perform a, a, a deceleration burn that will put your spacecraft into orbit around the moon. But nowadays, spacecraft like Korea's Danuri Lunar Orbiter miss the moon completely, like some Kerbal Space Program amateur. But as the spacecraft heads out into deep space, it sort of dances along the edge of the stability between the Earth and the Sun, and that somehow raises its orbit, and it falls back almost in line with the lunar orbit, and then it, when it arrives there, it sits just outside the moon's sphere of influence before falling in and getting captured. Here's another example, the Lunar Flashlight mission. This one instead heads away from the sun, hangs out in deep space while its orbit gets lifted and eventually comes back to the moon and carefully enters orbit after a few uh, close interactions. So I want to talk about these strange orbits and why they're being used. Well, the reason why they're being used is because they take less propellant, but to do this, you have to take a whole lot longer. So for example, Lunar Flashlight just launched a week or so ago, but it's going to take until March before it actually gets into orbit around the moon. Whereas, for example, Orion launched and it was less than a week before it got to the moon because it went by a more direct route. The direct route solves the orbital mechanics as a two-body problem with a single gravitating body and the spacecraft. This is very similar to what Apollo did or Kerbal Space Program, where you're only ever orbiting one object at a time. But now, these new techniques allow you to use three-body problems, and that adds a whole lot more possibilities for you to exploit. There's two techniques that are involved here that are both broadly related, but one is called ballistic capture. That is where you get captured into a loose orbit around the target without having to expend any propellant. The other technique is called weak stability boundaries, and that's where you exploit positions in the Earth, Moon, Sun system where the gravity between two or more bodies cancels out to create a weak boundary between the two uh, like spheres of influence. And if you've been following this channel, you'll know that this is where the Lagrange points are. So we have the L1 point that is between two orbiting bodies and the L2 point which is on the far side of uh, the lighter orbiting body. If we look at it from above, these contour lines show essentially the force of gravity and you know, technically a rotational force as well. But where these are nice and circular, you will get nice, simple Keplerian orbits that don't change over time. But near the L1 and the L2 points, things go a little weird and you have this hump, you have this sort of saddle-shaped valley, and the orbits are no longer simple, elliptical and unchanging. So in the case of the Sun and the Earth, the Lagrange points are about 1.5 million kilometers away from the Earth. But also, this diagram, while it does show the Sun and the Earth, you can equally do this for the Earth and the Moon, and we will use that for the ballistic capture. But let's go back to the big picture and watch one of these orbits in progress. So this is generated using Universe Sandbox. It's mostly guesswork, you know, tweaking values until I finally got an orbit that worked. So you can see it's heading out beyond the moon's orbit and out close to the, the L1 point between the Earth and the Sun in this case. Now, as it gets out there, you've got to imagine that there is this saddle-shaped valley now which is providing some force pushing, accelerating the spacecraft downwards. But also, there's not as much force pushing it back towards the Earth. And the combination of these forces mean that the orbit starts to have its perigee raised up above the Earth until eventually, through these forces, its perigee is higher than the Moon's orbit. So by launching the spacecraft into this region where the gravitational forces aren't a simple inverse square law, we've managed to raise our orbit. Now the next trick is we're falling back, and we've timed it 
so that we pretty much arrive just above the moon's orbit when the moon is there. So the moon's gravity starts affecting the orbit of our spacecraft until we fall into an orbit around the moon. And you'll notice that we actually kind of fell in close to the lunar L2 point on the far side of the Earth-Moon system. Now I want to switch back to this diagram to give you an idea of why it's important to fall in through these Lagrange points. So if you imagine a particle, it wants to kind of roll downhill, and as it does that, it picks up energy. And the more en it picks up more energy, the further it rolls downhill. So if you want to come into the moon system with the least amount of speed, you want to find the lowest point that brings you into the system. So the L1 and the L2 points, those are the lowest points, therefore you'll fall in with the lowest speed possible, and therefore have a much easier capture. Now, it is important to realize that the energy that it gets is conserved. Therefore, if it falls in, it can fall back out again. It might spend a few orbits near the moon, but ideally, you would want to perform like a, an orbital insertion burn at some appropriate time to slow yourself down. And because you're coming in more slowly, this will tend to be a less, a lower uh, delta V burn that would be needed with something like an Apollo capture. Now, wait a second, I hear you say. Surely having to go to this much further trajectory initially, you're having to spend more delta V. Well, turns out that it takes about 2.8 kilometers per second to go from a low Earth orbit to encountering the moon. To go that little bit further to get into this weak stability space, that only takes about 50 meters per second extra. And then after that, it's more or less free. You can, if you had a perfect trajectory, come down and encounter the moon and get into a loosely bound orbit without spending any delta V. Although, in practice, you're going to have to spend a bit of time, you know, spend a little of fuel, you know, trimming your orbit, making sure that you're exactly on course and correcting any errors in the trajectory that you've actually uh, built up. So now, how do you go about finding these kind of transfer trajectories? And Turns out that it's actually better to work backwards. Start from where you want to be and then find routes that go backwards in time. So this is using Universe Sandbox or a simple demo of how we can use time reversal. What I did was I used like the uh, you know, the ring tool to put you know, a couple of hundred particles around the moon in a loosely bound orbit. And then I'm just letting it run forwards in time and I'm deleting anything that comes out too early because if it comes out too early, it's in an unstable orbit. You want something that is going to have spent some time around the moon. And then, you, once you've found one that's uh, spent enough time, you can then delete all the others, reverse time, and then watch this fall back into the moon's influence and then spend its life orbiting the moon. Now, obviously, tools that an astrodynamicist will be using will have a few more options, a lot more scripting, but ultimately, it's the same principle. But one approach that I want to cover is where you take the four-body problem of the Earth, the Moon, and the Sun, and the spacecraft and split it into two different three-body problems. One where it's the Earth, Moon, and spacecraft, and the other is the Earth, Sun, and spacecraft. So you start with ballistic capture, and what you've got here is an object in a halo orbit just beyond the hypothetical Moon, and it forms this sort of ellipse here. This is perfectly balanced here between the forces of gravity and rotation. And if it gets pushed one way or another, it will either fall inwards or fall outwards. So it turns out that if you plot lots of different variations on these orbits, then it forms these kind of spiral patterns, which they are referred to as manifolds. Now, I talk about manifolds when I'm talking about rocket designs. You know, they're basically places through which propellant will flow so it can be delivered to, say, an injector system. Well, these actually define tubes in the rotating space where orbits can flow from one place to another. So objects moving in the vicinity of the Lagrange point can do, you know, one of four different things. The blue ones on the side, those come in, but they bounce off because they don't have the ability to get over the hump. The black one is the perfect orbit that's sitting exactly on the, the halo there. The green one is spiraling into that halo orbit, and the red orbits are actually passing through the middle of it because they have a bit more energy. So these manifolds basically are the tunnels through which your orbit has to pass if it's going to enter into the moon's orbit on a nice, low-velocity ballistic capture trajectory. So you can run the calculations and run it backwards in time, and you find that these tubes extend outwards in any, again, any orbits that are going to 
be captured by the moon have to fall through this. So now you start finding solutions for the other side where it's the Earth, Sun and spacecraft and you're basically throwing something up from the Earth having it linger near one of the Lagrange points and then come back. And what you're looking at is this line which is basically runs through the Earth and is perpendicular to the Sun direction. Finally, you can then adjust the Moon solution by rotating the Moon you know, over time so that the two solutions end up joining at a point. And then all you need to do is find the ones where you have the lowest change in velocity from one side to the other. And look, many of you found that complicated to follow. It's actually more complicated in real life because the plane of orbits of the Sun and the Moon and the Earth don't all line up. What I do want you to understand is that you can navigate by running orbits both forwards and backwards in time to find the solutions you need. Another thing worth mentioning is that you don't need to use both of these techniques, right? So you can use ballistic capture even if you aren't using these big uh, extended orbits. This is the orbit of SMART-1 and it actually rose from low Earth orbit up to the Moon using an ion engine. The problem is that if you have an ion engine, it has very low thrust, so it took them a long time to get there. And for the same reason, their capture into lunar orbit would be a slow, drawn-out process. So they had to use ballistic capture to make sure that when they got into lunar orbit, that they wouldn't come in and immediately get kicked out back into deep space. So they had to very carefully, again, enter through the, like, the region around the Lagrange point, into an orbit which would be stable for sufficiently long that they could use the, or the engine to slow themselves down and remain captured permanently. Finally, I want to give credit to the person that originally created this idea for these orbits. So this is a Japanese spacecraft called Hyten. It's actually two spacecraft. Muses A is on the right and Muses B is on the left. And the idea was this was going to fly past the moon and drop this tiny spacecraft and it would go into lunar orbit. And Japan would be able to say they were the third nation to put a spacecraft into lunar orbit. Now, it did that. The big spacecraft didn't have enough fuel to actually get into lunar orbit. It was just going to do a lot of flybys. And then this researcher at JPL published this uh, memo basically saying, actually, I've come up with this really neat orbit which will allow us to put this spacecraft into orbit around the moon. You know, that navigation techniques had not been invented at the time the spacecraft was launched. His name was Ed Bell Bruno, and he published this little diagram which looks pretty much like the orbits that we're using today. I actually had the pleasure of meeting him when I was in Italy at a conference and I remember sitting at dinner table drinking wine as he tried to explain this to me and I didn't really understand it at the time. I'm sure it was all about the wine rather than the fact that this stuff blew my mind. He'd been working on a project that was called Lunar Gas. It was a tiny spacecraft which would fit into a getaway special container that would, you basically they put these on the side of the space shuttle payload bay. It was a small thing for an experiment. And they came up with a way of fitting a spacecraft into this space and having it be able to fly out to the moon and actually get into orbit. Now that never happened, but the astrodynamics work he did laid the groundwork for all of the missions that are flying today. And now these spacecraft, they can spend more of their mass budget on spacecraft hardware as opposed to fuel. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.